Welcome to the UFO Files. Tonight, we have a man who for over 15 years had meetings with high-ranking military and corporate officials who inhabit the shadowy world of ultra-secret projects. Dr. Stephen Greer is known to most of us in the UFO field, by name at least. Tonight, we are going to be able to meet the man, We're going to talk about his book, which is exciting. In fact, a very, very good read. It's called Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge. This book lays out the quest of Dr. Greer for disclosure. Stay tuned. This is a show you will not want to miss. Dr. Greer, how are you today? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, we've been following your career for some time. First of all, uh, am I correct in that you are actually a medical doctor? Yes, I'm an emergency uh, trauma MD, um, chairman of a busy emergency uh, department uh, for about a number of years and, and practiced in uh, North Carolina for about 10 years and uh, now working, of course, on taking care of the emergency dealing with the earth. So uh, I've moved from one uh, emergency to another. I understand. We're going to get into a disclosure uh, here in detail in a moment. Um, uh, I guess really run right off the top of the bat, maybe I'd like to find out a little bit about uh, what uh, got you involved in all of this to begin with. Well, you know, that's a really quite a long story. My, um, yeah, I, I have a new book out called Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, and um, that people can uh, see some of it at the disclosureproject.org. And I wrote that book because so many people have wondered, you know, how is it that a uh, emergency physician and uh, someone in my position gets so involved in this issue, and uh, because it's fairly unusual, and it's mainly because when I was young, I had a sighting and experience with an ET vehicle. Uh, back when I was very young, about eight or nine years of age, and uh, this coincided with the time when my uh, maternal uncle was designing the lunar module. Uh, you know, the limb is what took uh, the astronaut to the moon uh, and the landing in 19. With Neil Armstrong and, and those all and all, and so uh, I've had uh, connection to aerospace and also to this particular area from personal experience since I was a very young boy. And uh, subsequent to that, I, I had some uh, really extraordinary experiences. Uh, uh, following a near-death experience I had, I, I had an experience with a, an ET vehicle and a contact experience that lasted for a number of hours uh, when I was 18, and so. Uh, my interest is not just academic. I know for a certainty these things exist, and uh, I know for a certainty that they are not hostile, and well, we know that the, the secrecy surrounding the issue is being run by an uh, extra-constitutional and illegal operation. That yeah, I, I want to get into all that with you in a minute, Dr. Greer, but uh, something piqued my interest about, uh, you mentioned the lunar module. And Buzz Aldrin has just made some news saying they saw a UFO uh, while they were on the moon. Did you ever hear about that? Oh, yes. I mean, I've known this for some time, and, and certainly my people have worked with Buzz Aldrin. And, and uh, you know, one of my uh, supporters is a good friend with Neil Armstrong. And uh, I've known for many years that when we landed on the moon that we were not alone. And that, in fact, uh, the reason some of the footage that people have seen from the, the, the lunar landing looks hoax is because they knew prior to the landing that there would be ET vehicles very likely there because they had documented them around the Earth, and it's important to realize that uh, during the lunar orbiter mission, which is different from the landing mission of the uh, Apollo, the lunar orbiters, they were taking pictures and mapping the moon, but we have uh, several top secret witnesses, uh, one of whom was at Langley Air Force Base at a uh, very classified national security agency operation there where they were downloading images from the moon that showed structures and craft and artificial buildings that were already on the moon in the mid to late 60s prior to the lunar landing. So when we put the first man on the moon, we knew that there would be uh, a very high likelihood of an encounter, and that's why some of what was transmitted back had to be, as it were, filtered uh, and was filtered so that people would not see that there were, in fact, uh, ET craft that accompanied uh, the lunar landing, the first uh, landing of men on the moon. So uh, this has been known in circles that I work with for quite some time, or actually since it happened, and uh, we describe this in this new book uh, that, that I have out because I think it's important for people to understand 
understand that there's the real uh, space pro program that's very classified and quote unquote black, and then there's the space program that everyone hears about on CNN, which is of course just uh, window dressing and, and really space junk uh, for the most part. Now I've been reading your book. It's a great read, by the way. Uh, one of the things uh, I wanted to find out from you, uh, I got understand the extraterrestrial uh, uh, possibilities and the UFOs, but you're interested in an alternative energy systems as well, right? Well, those are synonyms. I mean, what the what, what the alternative energy people don't understand, what the UFO people don't understand, is that the secrecy surrounding uh, the uh, very major breakthroughs in energy and propulsion technologies that have to do with anti gravity electrogravitic systems, so-called zero-point free energy systems, and the secrecy around the UFO issue are two sides of the same coin, that basically, uh, you know, no one in the business calls these things UFOs. They're either called ETVs, which is an extraterrestrial vehicle, which is what they've been called at the National Security Agency and other uh, operation centers, or they're called ARVs, which means alien reproduction vehicles, which are things that look like UFOs that are manufactured by Lockheed and Northrop and... Uh, uh, working with companies like SAIC, uh, Science Applications International Corporation, and, and a few other corporations who have dealt with this issue for many, many decades. So back engineering is live and well. It's not just back engineering, though, and this is another misunderstanding and part of the UFO sort of the wastebasket of, of, you know, lack of good analysis is, uh, you know, yes, we, of course, have, have retrieved and studied extraterrestrial vehicles. People need to understand that all the way back in the 20s and 30s, there were uh, tests being done by people like T. Townsend Brown. Uh, there were people who were in Germany working on things that dealt with uh, resonance frequencies and crystalline structures of materials that resulted in a mass cancellation and uh, a so-called anti-gravity effect. And so these things have been studied by humans. I, I, I point out to people the laws of the universe are, of course, universal. And uh, there have been substantial breakthroughs in the human uh, arena, uh, dealing with a very significant energy and, and propulsion systems, which unfortunately have been kept secret for most of the last century uh, because of the interests of big oil and the big financial system uh, controllers, basically, who, who run planet Earth, and it's certainly not the people we elect to, to Washington. So I think that what people have to understand is that the secrecy surrounding uh, so-called UFOs and the secrecy surrounding these major breakthroughs in energy and propulsion are one and the same. Now, don't you have an energy and propulsion project yourself? Yes, we are working. Uh, since 9-11, uh, we concluded that uh, we needed to move Disclosure, uh, and of course, DisclosureProject.org um, has you know, hundreds of these top secret military and intelligence witnesses who come forward, uh, that we needed to move from testimony and documents and that kind of evidence to building up uh, to the extent that we can get the scientists to, to uh, cooperate with us on this. Uh, some of these uh, so-called zero-point or free energy systems uh, to be able to change uh, the dynamics on the planet today where essentially we're a terminal civilization that uh, has no sustainable future because of the fact that we're completely dependent on uh, fossil fuels and oil and gas and coal. And I think that uh, this is why our next step in this whole effort, and, and we've made significant progress in the last year in identifying folks who, who do know about these sorts of alternative systems and who are working with us to, uh, to begin to fabricate those. Um, I, will, I would hope that uh, in, in the next year or two we'd be able to actually come out with one of these systems. But a lot of the problems with this have to do with uh, getting folks to step forward on something that they uh, have been threatened to keep quiet on, but also you know, funding issues. Uh, while there's lots of funding, we're spending $5 billion a year to study global warming. Uh, we're not spending anything to fix the problem. And this is, this is of course, typical of uh, the way folks uh, want to manage this thing. You know, let's describe the problem. Let's not suggest any viable solutions. And what we're trying to say is, yeah, okay, we can describe the problem all you want. Uh, and it's been well described, and it's well known to everyone but the people who are ostriches with their heads in the sand. But what we really want to do is, is, is work on a uh, civilian Manhattan-style project to get these energy and propulsion systems perfected and out to the public. Uh, and so they're not just sitting in, in black boxes at Lockheed Skunk Works and, and Northrop. Are, are you making any progress? Yes, we are, in fact. And uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. I say that because... You know, the, the kind of uh, heavy lifting 
and one has to do on this issue is substantial. And uh, the, you know, you're you're trying to we're trying to do a technical effort. And the big problem has been funding. If you if you study this area of energy and propulsion, the folks who uh, have have dealt with this uh, have either been pulled into these classified projects and silenced. Uh, many of them have, in fact, been murdered and or assassinated or threatened. The ones that are left are either timid or completely unfunded, meaning they're doing this in their basement or in their garage. And, you know, you're not going to start an entirely new science and energy sector with a few thousand or a few hundred thousand dollars. I mean, we really need to develop a funding, a line of funding that's in the 50 to $100 million range. Now, when you go up against the energy companies, uh, among others, as you mentioned, uh, it's it's a, like a David and Goliath story. Of course, I mean these guys are sitting on a two hundred trillion dollar asset base. If you look at the uh, proven oil and gas and coal reserves that are in around the world, and these are controlled by a handful of individuals and, and states, uh, families, uh, and uh, that's a, an enormous asset base. I mean, it's two hundred thousand billion dollars worth of proven. That's that, that's uh, I need more than one calculator to get there. <laughs> worth the entire financial system on the, of, of the world and the entire industrial westernized world is almost completely dependent on that. So, you know, you're talking about, and, and this is the, the thing I point out to people, you know, they're not keeping this whole issue secret because they're afraid people are going to hurl themselves off the Brooklyn Bridge because there's uh, extraterrestrial life out there. They're keeping it secret because if they disclose the fact that the UFOs are real and that some of them are of extraterrestrial origin, uh, it's going to come out that there are also ones that we have been studying and building and that we do not need oil, gas, and coal. In fact, we also don't need the uh, the, the famous Eisenhower interstate system that, that celebrated its 50th anniversary of this summer. Uh, we have not needed surface roads between cities since that system was conceived of in the 50s. We already had prototypes of these so-called electrogravitic and anti-gravity craft that were functioning. I have photographs of them from the early 60s flying over Provo, Utah, and they were man-made ones, by the way. So, you know, this is a, important for people to understand is that there's an entire uh, area of uh, mil- uh, industrial and financial uh, military intelligence operations that are extremely secret. And one of the things we tried to do, of course, uh, through uh, throughout the Clinton years and up until uh, through the, the present moment, is to get uh, folks uh, in the legitimate governments of the world to take the matter seriously and to facilitate disclosure, and, which is why we spent a great deal of time uh, during the early Clinton administration. For example, I, I personally briefed uh, Clinton's first CIA director on this problem uh, and many of Clinton's uh, inner circle folks, and we were encouraging them to move this issue uh, to disclosure since the end of the Cold War had occurred and that we felt it was an opening to do this. Unfortunately, the political courage isn't there, and one of uh, one of Clinton's friends came to my home and said, well, you know, uh, they very much agree with what you're recommending, that this matter should be disclosed, but um, they're convinced that if the president does what you're recommending, he will end up like Jack Kennedy. And with that, I burst out laughing, to be quite honest with you. I thought the guy was utterly, had to be joking. I said, it's like a bad John Le Carre novel or something. And, uh, uh, but in fact, he was serious. And he said uh, that the, the interests don't want to keep this secret or, or powerful enough that they could eliminate uh, the U.S. president. And so I said, well, he's the president. I'm not. I mean, I'm just, you know, at the time, I was a, uh, I, my lie, I'm a country doctor from Virginia now, but at the time, I was living in North Carolina. And I said, he's, he's the president. Uh, he has the responsibility to do this, but of course he didn't. And so, uh, subsequently, we've met with many members of Congress, uh, members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, other senators and congressmen, who are very interested in the subject. And what I find is that a lot of these leaders want to know, but very few of them want to do anything about it. And so, there, there's a there's a gap between people's interest in this, which is substantial, more than you can imagine, in these high circles of Washington and military and other circles. But very few people want to take the lead. Uh, it's the old saying, in America, everyone likes to be first to be second. Nobody really wants to stick their neck out on something like this. And so what has happened is that, it's, it's, in a sense, it's devolved back onto our shoulders to try to get this information out to the public and also now to try to put together uh, the uh, scientists uh, to get these technologies, at least the first uh, early generation versions of them, uh, out to the public. You know, when we talk about... Uh 
uh, the, this project? Uh, is there going to be, uh, I mean, is, is the problem basically that you're gutting an industry that may be uh, numbered uh, as long as uh, years or uh, decades anyway in existence because of natural resources wearing out? But I, I, what I'm asking is basically, um, how are you going to get around the profit motive? That's the greed and making money uh, seems to be, uh, you know, the number one thing in the world. We'll be right back with Dr. Stephen Greer. The name of the book is Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this commercial work. It happened almost 60 years ago, but the debate still rages. Did an alien spacecraft crash outside Roswell, New Mexico in 1947? The most concise and complete series ever broadcast on Roswell. Direct from Roswell. New programs added weekly. Check it out on the UFO Files. On jerrypippen.com we're talking with Dr. Stephen Greer, best known for his efforts with disclosure. Dr. Greer, in his book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, you're talking about a cabal of sorts, a hidden government made up of major contracting corporations, U.S. agencies, private financial and religious interest. They're all banded together. As I said, Dr. Greer, before we went to the break, it seems to me that all of this boils down to one word, greed. I mean, we're talking about your alternative energy discoveries, and there's, uh, you know, so much invested in fossil fuels that really, to me, seems to be a matter of greed. These people are not going to give up their money machine very easily. Well, it is, but, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of this being uh, evolving. For example, obviously when cars came along, the horse and buggy industry went belly up. When uh, word processors came along, uh, all of the typewriters and other typewriter companies had to either evolve or they went belly up. And, uh, you know, the, the energy and transportation sector similarly would have to be transformed. But I have to point out something here. You know, about the 80% of the world's population are living in appallingly impoverished conditions. I mean, only about 20% of the 6 billion people on this planet live anything like the, 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 the 280 million or 300 million Americans and, and 320 million Europeans. Um, you're looking at a world that is greatly underdeveloped. And if you had these sorts of technologies where you could then electrify and have transportation and manufacturing without any pollution all throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Asia, China, you would have a burgeoning world economy that would be a tide that would lift all ships and would enormously raise the fortunes of all of humanity, not to mention the fact that we would then have a sustainable civilization that would not be creating global warming and, and pollution and resource depletion and enormous dependence on the West being uh, decamped in the uh, Middle East where we are despised for having a very strong presence protecting our oil interests. And so I think that there are many, many of the problems that the world is facing are related to this uh, unnatural addiction to fossil fuels that have gone on for a few decades too long. And so what we're recommending, and by the way, I have to point out that this uh, this covert control group that some have called MJ-12, uh, which now are about two or 300 people involved with that, I've met with some of them. Oh, really? Oh, sure. And, and frankly, these folks, about a half of them now, would like to see disclosure happen. Of course, there's still a hardcore uh, number of them that don't. But there's a growing number. Uh, when I first was meeting with the Clinton administration folks and uh, the CIA director Woolsey on this, I was told by two independent sources that about a third of that uh, entity wanted this information out and wanted disclosure to happen. I'm now told that it's really closer to half. And so I feel that this is inevitable that th this information will come out. The problem is, will it come out soon enough? And, and you know, we're facing some very serious, hard, timelines here. Uh, one of them 
global warming uh, and, and so much uh, resource depletion and, and so much geopolitical instability due to this growing uh, divide between the haves and the have-nots around the world that, you know, will we reach a point of, of no return? And, and what we're recommending is that before we re- go into such a, a, a global civilization meltdown, let's get these technologies and this information introduced. Uh, and so we have something to begin to uh, replace the old smokestack industrial uh, order with something that's truly high-tech and sustainable. And, and remember that if this information were disclosed fully today and you had a fully operational energy device that was extracting energy from, from what the Dr. Bearden calls the, the quantum vacuum or the zero-point energy field, it, it would take 10 to 20 years minimum to change the way the world is running. It's not as if you're going to wave a fairy wand and suddenly everyone's going to have these things in, under the hood of their car and, and running uh, their, their homes and businesses. So we need to be doing this now. This is a very long-term uh, uh, alter, alter, you know, altering of the, the, the way the world runs. And this is not going to happen uh, just overnight. And so in order for this transition to happen and to avoid the worst uh, sequela of the sort of uh, abuse of the environment and geopolitical instability that we're facing, this needs to begin to happen uh, absolutely right now. In fact, this is why we felt that uh, we really needed to have this done by the early to mid-90s. But, of course, you know, the political structure being what it is uh, and the corruption being what it is, it was very, uh, it's very difficult to get that accomplished. We're very impressed, and I'm sure you felt you were making a lot of progress before 9-11 on disclosure. Politically. Oh, sure, yeah. We had uh, so many congressional offices um, have making inquiries and uh, there's tremendous interest. Uh, and, and that kind of killed it, I guess. No, it didn't kill it. it the problem is, is that it refocused everyone's attention to something that they felt was a, an imminent threat to our national survival and also funding and what have you. And so um, it was something which uh, had everyone uh, take their eye off this issue and put it on the, the the immediate uh, suffering and, and fear that surrounded the, the whole 9-11 uh, mess. And I think that this is, uh, of course, un- unfortunate, but, uh, but predictable. And uh, it's also why I feel that given the um, uh, corruption that we see in the big media, and, and by the way, if you were to ask me, of all the institutions on Earth, military, uh, industrial, energy sector, political, Intelligence, the most corrupt of all institutions on the earth is the big media, and uh, by far. And they're the most infiltrated and the most craven. And so the problem with that is that getting this information out and making this change happen is difficult even when you have significant support in the Congress because those guys say, well, we're just going to be ridiculed if we talk about this issue. And the big media and the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN are, are not going to allow us to do it without taking us down. So the big media, which have been infiltrated by uh, corporate financial interests for many decades on this matter, and in fact, I have a CIA document from 1991 during the first Bush presidency that explicitly states that they have contacts in all the major media in the world to control stories or to contain them or to change them to their advantage. And this is an uncontested uh, document that uh, was uh, declassified briefly that we acquired, and I understand it's since gone black again, which is on our website on disclosureproject.org. And uh, I've written a whole expose of this sort of a media corruption. So you need to be able to have not only the technology beginning to come forward, but you need eventually to be able to um, acquire or create an entirely new media that would rival anything that CNN or Fox or uh, the New York Times, Washington Post could do because uh, the organs of communication to the masses of the planet are uh, very corrupted. And I, I agree with you completely. I've been in the media 45 years. And, uh... I, mean, I have a board member who was on the board of a, a Time Life tour with AOL Time Warner, which now on CNN, and, and this man told me point blank, he was very good friends with Mike Wallace at 60 Minutes, he says, you know, we have just become scribes taking dictation at the right hand of the king. He says, he says the fourth estate, as people think of it, has been dead for decades. And uh, this is a board member of, of, of this huge media empire, told me this at a, at a New York penthouse uh, back in the 90s. And I've had other things similar to that said to me. So, you know, one of the problems, of course, is that what the 
then happens to this sort of this notion of a democracy with the checks and balances and a quote free press that's independent, not corrupted, and can be the so-called fourth estate. Well, that has gone the way of all flesh, quite frankly, and it doesn't exist anymore. And this is a serious problem because the organs of communication, therefore, where the masses get their information, has been very corrupted. Yeah, it's corrupted completely, in my opinion, and, uh, you know, uh, now they're moving in on uh, the last bastion of uh, freedom here, the Internet, and uh, we're trying our best, but it doesn't uh, look very good in the future. A lot of people want to control that. Uh, sure, of course they do, and, and even now, of course, it has to do with uh, search engine control and what comes up. And uh, But I will say that when we had our National Press Club event at the National uh, Press Club back in 2001 with these, uh, you know, about 20 of these top-secret military witnesses, Speaking, that was covered on every major network in the world. Now, what happened is that some of the big ones had been in touch with me that wanted to do follow-on exposés that would be an hour or two hours. They all got called and told to kill those programs. Um, you know, big stories that were going to be in the Wall Street Journal, that were going to be on ABC, a primetime live in 2020. Those executive producers point blank told me they wanted to do this. And then they called me a couple weeks later and said, you know, they're not going to let us do this story. And uh, when I asked the ABC executive producer why, he says, well, Dr. Greer, you know who they are and why they're wanting to keep this uh, uh, off the air. So it, it's I've been, you know, very up close and personal to seeing this kind of intimidation and corruption happen. And it's a real shame because the average American just doesn't know. And uh, I, many times when I'm given a, a presentation to a mainstream audience or what have you, people say, well, if this is all true and you have all these witnesses and all this evidence and all these insiders and whistleblowers, why isn't this on, you know, the front page of the New York Times and what have you? I said, it's a very good question. And, of course, it gets to this whole discussion of the, the uh, sort of uh, complete corruption uh, of, of the, the big mainstream media. And it isn't to say that the small media and, and certain radio shows and, and smaller papers can't cover this, and they do. But that doesn't change what the masses take as their consensual. Well, how, how do we get around this? Uh, just what I said. We have to. I think the first step is that we need to uh, find enough independent funding to complete these energy projects that we've started. We need to come out with these new energy and propulsion systems that will, will be the foundation of a new and sustainable civilization. That would give us enough revenue and enough uh, financial capability to either purchase or start an entirely new media uh, empire. And I'm not talking here if you uh, talk about in the billions of dollars. That's what you need if you want to get involved in that level. And and I tell people, people hear that and they say, is that really what you're planning to do? I said, yes, it's what we need to plan to do. You can't think in a small way and achieve anything on this issue because you're dealing with, as, as you mentioned earlier, this sort of 10,000-pound gorilla of, uh, of the energy and transportation and financial sector that's running the world today. It's a multi, multi-trillion dollar um, goliath. And uh, as Davids, we have to think of how to strategically make this happen. Uh, and we need to think uh, not only that it can be done, but it certainly must be done. And there is a way to do it, and we have to figure that out. So this brings me up to the uh, point of disclosure at this moment. Uh, I know you recently went to Canada for disclosure uh, presentation uh, and meetings. Uh, what, what, what's the status of disclosure? Well, it, there's tremendous interest around the world. It's interesting because... Uh, uh, or a year or two ago, the World Affairs Journal, which is the international counterpoint to the uh, Council on Foreign Relations Foreign Affairs Journal, uh, and the World Affairs Journal is published out of India, uh, they asked me to do a special article about disclosure for the journal that's read by virtually every uh, foreign prime minister and foreign minister in the world. Um, the head of uh, the Minister of Defense uh, for uh, Canada some years ago, uh, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, has come out publicly in favor of disclosure. He and I spent the whole day together uh, back in May and then had a press briefing uh, following our, our meeting. And he has, has publicly stated that, you know, there's a, uh, there's a permanent government that exists around the world, and then there's the elected government that, that you and I think we're electing. And uh, the ones that we elect really have very little control over these issues, and this permanent government is pretty much running the show. And he's, you know, this is a man who was, uh, uh, you know, a cabinet member under uh, two prime ministers of, of Canada, and, and he's very sophisticated and very sharp and very bright and understands what the dynamics are. And it's really about geopolitical control. And uh, a lot of people say, oh, it's about money. I said, 
and I think we need to send our kids to college. This is about massive amounts of geopolitical power uh, when you start talking about those sums of money and that kind of control. And uh, that's really uh, what has to be not only uh, reined in and, and exposed, but replaced with a whole new way of thinking, that we have to look at a way to transform that situation to something that is uh, uplifts all of humanity and is transformative. Uh, and the, the, the key to this is not only the information about the subject, but these fundamental technologies. You know, it doesn't matter how much you may have on your computer and bandwidth and, and fiber optics and all this stuff, but if we're running all of our computers off of, uh, in the United States, 56% of our electric power coming out of coal-fired uh, power plants like we were in the 1800s, uh, we really haven't gone anywhere as a civilization. And we are going to have to look at this and say, look, we really need this uh, issue where there's where, where the fundamental power dynamic, literal and figurative power of how the world runs, needs to be uh, transformed. And that's what uh, uh, is really at stake here. Now, now when we uh, talk about the big media, and I certainly agree with you, and it's not just here in the United States, but it's worldwide, um, I guess I don't feel like defending my brother, but somebody needs to say something about this. Uh, you, you just look at today's news. You have the Israeli-Lebanese Hezbollah compact uh, com, uh, conflict going on. You have more people, civil war breaking out in Iraq, and uh, you know, uh, the, obviously we went there under false pretenses. And I could go on and on and on. So it's hard to discuss you with folks. When we come back, we will be talking to Dr. Greer about his overall experiences in dealing with the black world, a secret government, as some call it. In your book, you talk, Dr. Greer, about former CIA Director Bill Colby being murdered. I remember he mysteriously drowned, and you said that it was because he was going to come forward with the truth about UFOs. Folks... You need to get the book and read about it. We're halfway through. This is an exciting discussion with Dr. Stephen Greer, so don't go away. My Search for the Afterlife is a book that explores real communications between a father and his deceased son. Uniquely authored from Beyond the Grave and co-authored in this world, the book chronicles the miraculous journey of communication beyond death. Learn more about the book, My Search for the Afterlife. Visit their website at www.mysearchfortheafterlife.com. That's mysearchfortheafterlife.com. Welcome to our second half hour. This is Jerry Pippen. Our guest is Dr. Stephen Greer. The name of the book is Hidden Truth and Forbidden Knowledge. You are listening to the UFO Files right here on jerrypippen.com. Well, one of the reasons why we found that it that, that we were able to make a lot of progress, um, at least more so than, than any group had over the last 50 years or so, is because we were able to say, look, it isn't about little green men. It's about who is running the world, and what are these UFOs? What technologies are represented by them? And what would the world be like? And what's the, what's the good future that awaits humanity if we could use these technologies for peaceful purposes? And I, I think that when people see what's at stake, uh, they become very interested in it. Well, we've had a lot of crossover mainstream interest and support in what we're doing. So I think that if you can relate this issue to something that is relevant to people's daily lives, and here, what's more relevant than the fact that the way we're living on the planet is cannibalizing it and destroying it for our children and grandchildren. Uh, you know, my grandson is turning one, one year old the next week, and I think, what kind of world are we le leaving him uh, and, uh, and our children's children's children uh, when we have these solutions, but we somehow haven't been able to get together on how to bring them out. And this is why I tell people who are listening, if there are people who know of institutes and, and funders who could get behind this energy effort, they need to contact us because we have uh, the immediate need right now is to put about a dozen of these top worldwide energy uh, te technologists and scientists that we have identified and vetted and who have real solutions under an engineering umbrella and get those technologies up to something that would be a Generation 1.0 version 
is an urgent need. Um, and it isn't something that requires billions of dollars like we're spending to study how to clean up coal. You know, we're, we have a 2000 million billion dollar we have a two billion dollar fund a two thousand million dollars that we're spending as taxpayers to figure out how to clean up coal emissions a little bit we you know if we had a tiny fraction of that you could come out with the complete solution so we would need coal at all so now people who own coal fields don't like that perhaps but the vast majority of, of americans and certainly of, of people on earth would like to see us move on to something uh, sustainable and something that uh, is more cost-effective. You know, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the world can't even get electrification because the cost of putting in the uh, linear infrastructure where you're dealing with uh, power lines, transmission lines, central power plants, never mind the cost of the oil and the coal to, to, to burn it, is prohibitive for, for, for many, many regions of the world. And so uh, the, the human race really cannot move forward until this issue gets dealt with. And this is the, the point that we're trying to make very clearly to folks uh, in the political, environmental, uh, and geopolitical world, and, and to just the general uh, man on the street. Because this is something that I think people do understand. Reading between the lines here, Dr. Greer, I, I get the impression that you're saying that it won't take all that much of a financial resource to change this, and that the people uh, listening or you know or have heard about and have contacted through second, third, fourth party, uh, just a fraction of those people could band together and really change the world. Correct. And we already have identified all those folks. Now we have to put the, the uh, support and funding mechanism in place. I don't have uh, an extra 10 to $50 million laying around to put a, a serious R&D effort together on this energy issue. But there are people who do. We need to identify those people, explain the situation, and say, look, even if it was done to a, as a grant, I mean, if you look at what, uh, uh, you know, the profit from Omaha is doing, Buffett and, and uh, the Gates Foundation, they're spending uh, tens of billions of dollars uh, really tinkering around the edges of the problems of the world. A tiny fraction of that kind of money would solve the central problem that's facing the world that inc that's causing so much poverty and so much disease. Uh, and you're not going to fix these dynamics uh, when you have 6 billion people becoming 7, becoming 9, becoming 10 billion, when you have this zero-sum game of fossil fuels and energy. So the fundamental solutions exist. We know what they are. We know what the, 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 the problems are. We know what the solutions are. We now have to find the way to put together the coalition to make that happen and to do it as soon as we can. Well, maybe someone out there is going to sell their shell stock and... <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. Give you some money and take a, a, a tax write-off in the meantime. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly can be done. And we, I have no doubt at all at this point, I wouldn't have said this uh, three or four years ago, but I have no doubt at this stage that we have identified the technologies and the people who understand them to put together into an R&D effort to get this done. But it isn't going to be done. You know, the level of support we've had have been, you know, a few thousand or even a couple hundred thousand dollars when we were trying to do this from mainly one or two supporters of what we're doing and mainly from, from myself and, and my own family. But to really do something like this, you know, you're going to need uh, some serious R&D funds, and that isn't going to happen with a few thousand dollars. You're not going to put on a team of, of, of a dozen engineers in a facility with the right equipment and fabricating capabilities for $100,000. I mean, you, let's live in the real world here. So that's, that's where we are now. To make this next step, we're going to have to do that, and, and we are seeking for people who have the right stuff, uh, as it were, a quote-unquote, in terms of their intent uh, to do this, because we're very skeptical of a lot of, you know, we've had some people approach us and say, oh, yes, but then, of course, they want to uh, take over the effort and then keep it secret. Uh, yeah, isn't that the way uh, it works? Uh, the people that uh, you're going to impact, they're going to try to infiltrate. To them, it's a battle. I mean, the thing is, the way we're going to have this structured is that the people who have the funds are never going to control the strategy, period. They can't. Because even if they don't know that that's their intent, I'll give you an example. There was a man who once said to me, oh, well, you know, I can put $5 million into this, but I want a majority of it. I said, no, it's not how this is going to work. He said, I, he said, why not? I said, well, let me give you a scenario. Let's say that happens, and 18 months later we have one of these things that will completely transform the energy sector. And someone comes along from one of these large corporations and offers you $5 billion for your $5 million investment. I asked him, what would you do? 
And this man said, well, I'm a businessman. I sell. I said, no, you're a money whore, and you've just sold <laughs> or two cents on the dollar, not even. And, and so, you know, <laughs> there's a difference between, you know, this is something where people have to understand that when there's trillions and hundreds of trillions of dollars at stake, strategically you cannot do this like you would a normal undertaking. Because if you do, it will be absorbed into a, an entity that will then put it on a black shelf. I mean, this is what General Electric and Westinghouse and GM and large corporations and, uh, have been doing for decades. I mean, I have personal friends friends who have uh, had breakthroughs in, in energy technologies that have been bought off by these sort of entities, and you never hear them coming out into the market. Why is that? Because these very large corporate empires and industrial empires are horizontally, horizontal and vertically mm-hmm. integrated into each other, and they are not going to let something out that uh, uh, completely makes uh, redundant uh, fossil fuels and oil and gas and coal. Well, we urge uh, someone for someone listening that. Uh uh, can help you out. They can contact you through your website, right? Correct at disclosureproject.org, uh, and uh, send me a note if they are serious. Uh, we will vet them and see. But uh, yes, well, that's where we are right now. And by the way, some of the the, the, the scientists that we've identified in, in the last year or two are really astonishing in terms of what they have in terms of proof of principle capability. They're not at the stage where they they would be a uh, something you could go out and use. But, and to get it from where that is today to something that would run your home or run your car uh, is not an impossible engineering task, but it's something that's going to take some serious support. What we're saying to folks is that uh, what has happened for decades in the so-called black budget of the United States and other countries where we have spent literally trillions of dollars that have gone into uh, private uh, corporate uh, covert programs dealing with studying so-called UFO technology, new energy technologies, uh, very advanced uh, propulsion systems. Uh, some tiny fraction of that needs to now be put uh, into this effort uh, so that we get a solution uh, out to, to the human race uh, and that it happen here in, in the next couple of years. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, the UFO angle here now. Uh, how many how many species do you think are out there? Well, I think there probably are thousands. How many are actually involved with observing the Earth? Yes, uh-huh. During, uh huh. Probably several dozen. I I, I had a um, a neocon uh, corporate flack write me a nice fellow, but he's we know where he's coming from. When he found out I was going to interview you, and he said that guy believes there's a hundred plus species out there. Uh, talking about you, uh, they always kind of try to attack the messenger, don't they? Well, sure, of course. And the fact of the matter is, is that if you look at even the most conservative Drake formula that, that Frank Dr. Frank Drake came up with, uh, it's in the tens of thousands of likely advanced civilizations that are out there. The question is, how many of them have uh, gone what I call through the threshold of light beyond the of light barrier, uh, what I call the crossing point of light, where through not a normal propulsion system, but something that has, some would say, interdimensional capability. 
these are this is a civilization which has a lot of promise and a lot of good about humanity, but also has a, a, unfortunately uh, developed technologies that have outstripped their social and spiritual development so much so that we could be not only a threat to life on Earth but could be a potential threat to life elsewhere out in the cosmos. And I think that is when we began to see this huge ramping up of fighting uh, in the in the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I think that it's understandable. Um, because of, of the fact that we're asymmetrically being developed. Uh, our society, uh, as I ma- mentioned, is, has, has developed enormous capabilities for warfare and destruction. Uh, unfortunately, not a concomitant level of development, of, of social and spiritual development, to where we can learn to live peacefully together. Yeah, it, it's almost like um, we don't want to do that. Here's the problem. I think the majority of humans do want to do that. And I've traveled all over the world. I've li- in fact, I lived in, in the Middle East for three years. My wife and I met in the Middle East and uh, in Israel and, and on Mount Carmel and Haifa that's now being bombed. And my first daughter was born there. And um, what I have found is that the vast majority of people everywhere would rather live peacefully. But there is this effort. I, I think it's a sort of a, what used to be called an agent provocateur. Uh, there is uh, an effort to keep that fire burning because it benefits a relatively small number of corporations and businesses. I mean, the whole world of military effort, for example, has now become a $1 trillion a year, mostly U.S. spending, by the way, uh, industry. Well, a trillion dollars a year, I mean, that's that's almost $100 billion a month going into this stuff. So, you know, uh, once again, I, I don't see that most of humanity really wants to be blowing each other up and killing their children and bombs and, and all this stuff. I, I think that it's a relatively small number of people. And I think, again, many of the problems uh, that have uh, been exacerbated over the last 50 years are directly related to the way that we're living on the Earth. Dr. Stephen Greer is our guest. A fascinating hour, I must say, Dr. Greer. We'll be back in a moment. House Resolution 635. This is Immortal Technique. When Richard Nixon abused power, Congress held a serious bipartisan investigation that resulted in articles of impeachment. Strong evidence suggested George Bush and Dick Cheney launched an illegal war in which tens of thousands of civilians were killed. We are told to look upon these deaths as an exaggeration or an acceptable loss in the war on terror. But this administration has lied to Congress, spied on Americans without court approval, leaked classified information, and produced phony news reports. People have been imprisoned without charges and tortured, and illegal weapons used. Ask your Congress member to co-sponsor House Resolution 635 for an investigation. Peace. Sponsored by AfterDowningStreet.org This is Jerry Pippen, and our guest is Dr. Stephen Greer, an interesting man for sure. We uh, mentioned on our UFO file sightings report we'd be interviewing you, and uh, always we get the uh, more conservative element being more vocal to us, and uh, for some reason that's just the way life is. And here's an email from a fellow who says, uh, "Part of uh, I've just read Greer's new book, and part of it is love with the aliens. It's all about love, like that's something terrible." Well, <laughs> people who are living, I, I think that there are a great many people who are addicted to conflict. And if you look at what's very popular in the UFO subculture, and also what's very popular in uh, movies and, and documentaries, it's the lurid sort of sexualized content, conflict, war in space, sort of this whole, uh, you know, uh, Independence Day, Armageddon scenario. And I think there's a certain uh, element that are very addicted to that. They love the idea that maybe we'll go from fighting each other in the sands of Iraq to fighting other extraterrestrial civilizations. Well, it seems almost that this administration is aimed that way. They've declared uh, the property between the moon and the earth near space uh, u.s territory we've uh, got all kinds of funding for space weapons well i got news for you i have witnesses who worked on projects as far back as the mid-1960s where we had already weaponized space and had very sophisticated weapons that were uh in space that were targeting extraterrestrial vehicles i mean people are 
were they actually shooting at them? Yes, we've actually hit them and downed them. And so uh, I have more than one independent corroborating witness who has been part of those sort of operations. Very dangerous, very stupid. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, when I met with some folks at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, for the division, uh, the so-called uh, Foreign Technology Division, um, which when I met with them was called FASTIC, the Foreign Aerospace Science and Technology Center, uh, the colonel who was there and, and an intelligence officer said, you know, well, you know, do you think these uh, extraterrestrials are hostile? I said, look, given what you guys have been doing <laughs> for over... They ought to be. <laughs> if they were hostile, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. The Earth would be a black cinder floating through space. Uh, I, I said, you know, I know, and I said, you folks know, that even the crash that happened in, in Roswell wasn't uh, a, a UFO that come all the way through interstellar space and somehow couldn't fly over New Mexico. I have an FBI document that was written by a field agent to J. Edgar Hoover that's been authenticated that states that it was likely because we had some high-powered radar arrays that were configured in such a way that it interfered with the electronic guidance systems because these ET crafts are completely electronic. They're not using fossil fuels or rockets. And so they collided in one crash to... Uh, north of uh, Roswell, one down towards uh, Socorro. And uh, so, you know, the, these things have been going for 50 or 60 years, and uh, almost 60 years now. And I think that one of the problems is that that's one of the, 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 the chief needs for disclosure is that there are a lot of rather dangerous things happening, in my opinion, that are off the radar screen of most of our presidents and most of our members of Congress, certainly the United Nations, and other governments around the world that are endangering, I believe, the future of the human race and I think are very reckless because there's no oversight and there's no discussion in an open way. And this is the, the vacuum of secrecy tends to create this sort of dysfunction, which, which I think is, is uh, highly uh, risky. Any um, evidence of uh, contact... Uh with extraterrestrials uh, either on a semi-official or official basis? You know, th this has been rumored for many years. I'm skeptical of that. I think perhaps in the 50s there might have been. Um, I think that to what extent we did have contact, we then betrayed that interest. Uh, my own personal opinion is that if you look at the old movie from 1951, The Date the Earth Stood Still, uh, I understand that was really a docudrama that was made at the encouragement of some of the people in our State Department um, to warn against the sort of reactionary and xenophobic militarization of the human uh, extraterrestrial relationship. And I think that uh, that since the 50s, uh, although there's a lot of, of rumors and rumors of rumors and rumors of rumors of rumors of, of sort of elaborate uh, ET and secret government uh, collusion, I'm very skeptical of that, and uh, I don't see the evidence for it, and certainly of the oh, nearly 500 uh, military and corporate and intelligence witnesses I've dealt with, none of them have any uh, thing that would indicate that that's uh, ongoing. Uh, of the 500 that you have experience with, uh, all of it uh, seems like if there is any aggression, we're doing it? Correct. Now, there are things that have happened that I think have been misinterpreted. For example, uh, we have a couple witnesses who were out in Minot, North Dakota, when there were well, somewhere between 16 and 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles that were uh, taken offline and rendered unlaunchable uh, back in the 60s. Uh, we have documents for it. We have these witnesses who are actually at the uh, launch control facilities that people can read about this. These people are not anonymous. Their name, rank, and serial number in our materials. What I think has happened is that um, some of those things happened when the ETs were saying, look, uh, don't destroy this beautiful planet, and if you do, do go to mutually assured destruction and launch all these nuclear weapons, we can intercept them or neutralize them. What people don't understand is at the same time that was happening in the United States, it was happening in, in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. And we have KGB documents and accounts from people in their uh, government from that era in the 60s and 70s where they had similar uh, events happen. So I think what the ETs were trying to say is, uh, look, we're watching this and we're concerned about it, but if you go to uh, mutual assured destruction, we can neutralize that capability. Now, you could take that as an act of uh, enlightened self-interest or even wisdom, or you could take that as uh, interfering with our military readiness and, and make 
make an enemy out of them. So you can spin this story two ways. What I'm saying to people is that we need to step back and look at the larger human problem and, and look at how that might appear through the eyes of another civilization else. You know, I've been doing shows like this for a long time and not nearly had the contacts you have at high-level government positions and military and probably even corporate uh, areas, but I get the unsettling feeling in the past couple of years that there's a group of these people, these so-called experts, these so-called movers and shakers that thinks we can take on these extraterrestrials in a, in a military fashion. Right. It's very disturbing. Well, it is, and, and the thing is, I mean, now why do they even think that? Well, I guess that I had, I had a Navy intelligence guy. Well, when I asked him this question back in the nineties, he says, you know, it's kind of like uh, dogs peeing on the fence post. It's like marking territory. He says it's dumb, it's arrogant, uh, it's just a mindset that's out there. Now, with that said, the vast majority of folks that I, because I've done briefings at the Pentagon for the head of intelligence for the Joint Staff, the J two position. I've done briefings for the uh, head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the most powerful intelligence entity at the Pentagon. Uh, I, and I've been personally there with some of our military witnesses and my and my military advisor. And uh, most of these men, and, and in the in the first place, don't have any knowledge of these projects. In the second place, don't control them. And in the third place, are very supportive of disclosure when they that they are being left out of the loop and that this is being run by a rogue transnational group that are literally endangering the future of the human race. So what I say to people is that remember that the vast, vast majority of people in the intelligence and military community are victims of this game as much or more so than the average American. I, I've noticed uh, just the little contact we do that uh, people that I don't uh, know 100% for sure, but we bet the farm on that they have uh, security connections either with the Defense Department or some other agency. Uh, many of them would like to see disclosure. I get that feeling. Yes, they do. And they'd talk more, except uh, evidently the price is pretty high to pay. How did you get all these people to talk? Well, first of all, we identified them over a number of years. Then we put them together as a group. And uh, before we went forward, we had people, both uh, high-placed people in the public, but also people within the covert circle, as I mentioned, there's about half of this so-called MJ-12 group support getting this out, who have extended protection to us. And, you know, one of the interesting things about this is that none of these people who come forward with us have even gotten a phone call saying, be quiet, not one. And there's a reason for that that I don't really want to go into uh, in an interview but suffice it to say, we've had meetings where we've put that kind of security and authorization for enforcement of that security in place. And our view of it is that, uh, you know, they may not support what we're doing in, in all cases, but they, they, they need to stay out of the way of it. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, and we are going to uh, talk about the book when we close the show. And we do have a link here where people can buy it uh, on the website and some information and over to your websites as well. And they need to take time to read about Dr. Stephen Greer. It's an interesting, interesting life. And I wish, uh, and in a future show, we're going to discuss maybe your early contacts. Yeah, that would be great. Because uh, that, that is part of the uh, the mantle of the man, so to speak, in my opinion. But uh, I to, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up CSETI. What's, you, you founded that, right? Right. The parent organization for the Disclosure Project is CSETI, and uh, people can see that at CSETI.org. And it was started in 1990 as an uh, interplanetary uh, ambassador program, for lack of a better concept. Um, I concluded that these uh, ET vehicles were real. I concluded that they were wanting to have contact in a peaceful fashion with humans, that they had done so over many decades, and that we needed to put teams of people together. And so what we do is that we train people in what I call the CE5 initiative, or Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative, where we take people out under the stars and teach them uh, techniques and protocols for uh, preparing themselves to, to make contact with these objects or with the uh, occupants of these objects uh, in a very broad uh, paradigm. We're using not only uh, lasers and electromagnetic signals, but we're using remote viewing and consciousness and some really very 
communicating across the best distances of space that are, you know, many, many thousands of light years. And I said, well, they're not using AT&T electromagnetic signals. And I began to discuss the fact that there's a nexus where consciousness, what we might call mind stuff, and thought and electromagnetism comes together. And it's a very interesting area of science, and it is a legitimate science. Uh, and that can be utilized for uh, both communication and uh, imaging of uh, off-planet uh, uh, operations and, and extraterrestrial craft. Their systems easily interface with what we would call coherent thoughts, like a laser is coherent light. Their systems interface with that as easily as you and I pick up a cell phone. Now, I remind people, even though that sounds outrageous to some folks, if you were to show someone a cell phone 500 years ago, you'd be burned at the stake of a witch because it would look like magic, uh, never mind a, a television camera or even a flashlight for that matter. So we're dealing with civilizations whose technologies have begun, have gone through the light barrier into these other, some would say, dimensions, but in a scientifically reproducible fashion. Hey, hey, do, you have, do you have any kind of clue about what their civilizations are like? Yes, we do. And uh, that's a long discussion. But let's just say that... Uh, We urge people to go over there. Sorry, our time's up. But, uh, it was uh, wonderful speaking with you. And uh, we um, look forward to talking to you again. And uh, in the book, is it uh, getting the reaction you thought it would or needed? Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's been uh, very widely supported. Because it's not easy writing a book. Yes, and this book was actually dictated and then had to be written from uh, about 45 hours of oral um, bit, uh, audio tape. I mean, people, uh, you know, I, 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 I know people read a lot of books every every week. And I think that's great. And another way, from the little bit of writing I do, it's a shame that they can go through what takes hours and years of sweat sometimes in in a matter of a day or two. But it, your book's a great read. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Greer. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. We've been talking with Dr. Stephen Greer. He's been on the line with us from his home near Charlottesville, Virginia. The name of the book, again, is Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge. We'll have to have him back soon, for sure. Thank you for listening, everyone. This program was produced and edited by the lovely Jane Swartley. Until next time, this is Jerry Pippen saying cheers.